Welcome to the Cat Cannabis Show, everybody. I am your host, Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis, but my friends all call me Cat, so I hope that you will too. We have a fabulous guest tonight. We want to get right to it. Um, we have author and journalist Scott Stevens with us tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Scott is a journalist posting regularly on health and alcohol issues for online news services and is a founding influencer at the world's largest medical portal, HealthTap. Stevens adds his stunning personal 86 proof two liters a day story and with um, research into alcoholism, sobriety, relapse, and recovery. We're going to be talking today about his book, which I just love the title of Look What Dragged the cat in. And so being a cat lover, I was immediately attracted to this book in the title. So without further ado, let's bring on our guest. Welcome to the show, Scott Stevens. Thank you, Kat. Honored to be here and I uh, appreciate the invite to talk about the new book and uh, expand the dialogue a little bit. So Scott, first of all, tell us where did you get this amazing title for your book and how did it tie into what you wrote about? Well, the the five books I've written all have a play on words in the title. Uh, for example, the first book I wrote was called What the Early Worm Gets, rather than talking mm -hmm. about the early bird gets the worm, what does the early worm get? So uh, I continue on with that idea. Every silver lining has a cloud and adding fire to the fuel. And then finally with this one, um, I, I haven't written a book for three years. Uh, it's about the gap in between for me. Uh, I knew that I would want to continue on with the idea of uh, a play on words in the title. The impetus for writing this book is all the talk about an opioid epidemic. And uh, I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, it's tragic. It is a crisis, but this isn't quite an epidemic. It is certainly a, a personal and family tragedy, but we have to put it in perspective with our other drugs of choice, including alcohol. So I'm talking about the blame game that goes on around the opioid crisis being blame the, blame the pharmaceutical companies or blame the medical profession. But if you back out of this, we're not going to solve anything by blaming everybody. We need to, instead of hear or pick up what the cat dragged in, we have to look at what dragged the cat in. Interesting. I love that. So for our audience, uh, get, give us an idea of what the difference is between a crisis and an epidemic that you're talking about, because they may not know. Sure. Uh, an epidemic looks like the 1918 flu epidemic. The Spanish flu killed 100 million people that year. Mm -hmm. The opioid crisis kills 46,000 Americans every year or in the last year. And the number has been going up. And I don't want to diminish that fact at all. Every one of those, every single one of those 46,000 is a is a personal tragedy for the family and it is a very real very live drug crisis but to consider it an epidemic when we have 90,000 American lives lost every year to our number one drug of choice 90,000 people are killed by alcohol which is more than all drugs combined so if we're not calling that an epidemic or a crisis I, I don't know that it's necessarily accurate or true that we're calling an opioid crisis, an epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more of a machination of the news industry. You know, we, they sensationalize, I say we, because I formerly am part of the news industry, but sensationalize things to gather people and to bring in the viewers. And uh, it's also a part of the political environment that we're in, that uh, alcohol is our biggest, most powerful lobby in the country. So naturally, the politicians are going to want to look at another substance and take the emphasis or take the the view off of our number one drug, our number one most deadly drug in this country. Mm -hmm. And you've had personal experience with this this alcoholism, haven't you? You want yes, to share I a little have, bit uh, of that with us? Sure, I'd be glad to. Presently, I work as an interventionist and obviously a journalist writing on alcohol and health. And all of that stems from my personal relationship with alcohol. I'm an alcoholic in long-term recovery. My last drink was October 17th, 2010. And prior to that, it was a really ugly journey. I almost died twice, once from alcohol overdose. My, I woke up in the ER with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.612. And by way of comparison, 0.40 is what killed singer Amy Winehouse. 
And then one other time, uh, because alcohol is one of the only two drug withdrawals that can kill you, um, I almost died from alcohol withdrawal. My blood pressure dropped to 49 over 17, and it was a, it was a tragic, tragic part for my family. For me, I just wanted to keep on drinking. I wanted alcohol more than I wanted my next breath because I was chemically dependent on alcohol. And at the end of my roller coaster ride, which wasn't a long portion of my life, this is basically from 2004 to 2007, I was at the peak drinking at least two liters of Jack Daniels every day and not drinking to get silly and uh, bomb, but drinking just to stave off the shakes. I was a maintenance drinker just so I could function, get down the stairs in my own house and still try to show up and perform at a, a very high profile job in the mutual fund business. But then uh, and finally I got, uh, as they say, sick and tired of being sick and tired. And yeah. uh, I entered long-term recovery uh, in 2010. And it's, I'm telling you, I'm living my best life ever. That is great. So, you know, I noticed when I was going through all of your information that you kept, I kept picking up, follow the money, follow the right. money. What, what do you mean by that? Well, when when you look at the political climate in the United States, and this is a, a large reason why we don't t- take uh, attention or pay attention to the alcohol epidemic in the United States, is because the alcohol industry is a very powerful lobby. Here, I live in the state of Wisconsin, and in Wisconsin, uh, our tavern league pretty much runs the show here. And when you have that kind of political influence and are able to influence elections and public policy, naturally the public policy is not going to be one toward more alcohol education and stricter confinement on alcohol availability. Um, I'm, I'm personally not in favor of prohibition. I think it's a, a crummy idea that we've run down that path once, and I'm certainly not advocating that at all. But we do need to look at how alcohol, what alcohol does to us rather than what we think alcohol does for us. Mm-hmm. Mm. That dialogue is really shut down by the, by the influence of the money in the alcohol industry. If you look at um, a bigger picture in, of the healthcare crisis, for example, we talk about the availability of health care, the access to health care, but we won't look at what's driving the access to health care. The one thing that is sucking the money out of it isn't aging baby boomers, it is the alcohol. Forty percent of general use hospital beds are going to treat alcohol-related com- complications, and that is a money drain on the system. Two, uh, two ER admissions every minute are alcohol-related. That's a drain on the system. But again, because the money is is in favor of continuing alcohol uh, consumption, both from the industry standpoint and from the political standpoint as a money gatherer, a tax revenue boon in a lot of local state and uh, local municipalities will increase the amount of tax to balance otherwise shaky budgets locally. And if we minimize consumption due to the health impact, including the impact on other addictions, then they have to look, they're, they're afraid of the revenue dwindling. Mm-hmm. And how does all of this tie into your book concerning the, the opioid crisis? Well, the opioid crisis, uh, when, I, when I, again, talk about the start of the crisis, I'm not looking at the solutions that are out there today. You know, we're mm-hmm. talking about increasing the availability of treatment. But again, that's after the fact. That's cleaning up what the cat dragged in. If we back up the tape here and look at the history, 66%, two-thirds of people who use illicit drugs use alcohol as their first drug. So if we want to reduce the impact of the cycle of epidemics, excuse me, crises, crises that we're in, mm-hmm. we have to look at the gateway drug that they're using first. Will people still use alcohol? Yeah, everybody. I mean, this is this is part of our culture. I'm not taking that part away. But if we're looking seriously at cleaning up the messes that the cat dragged in, we have to look at what dragged the cat in. And two-thirds of the cases of illicit drug users, that first drug of choice is alcohol. And the rest of us learn our drug-taking uh, pattern. We're, we're weaned on alcohol. We're groomed to be a generation or a culture of drinkers because of the prevalence of alcohol advertising 
and the way that we welcome it into our communities through community functions and uh, just embrace it as part of our culture rather than taking a step back and saying, whoa, wait a minute, not only does this drug have a connection to the opioid crisis that we're in today, but it also has detrimental health impacts, including linked to cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's part of our, our social lifestyle to a degree, that the alcoholism. So do you happen to have a copy of your book close uh, at hand? Yeah, I do. Can you hold it up? Uh, because I'm going to tell you, I okay. love the cover. Are you, you going to have your assistant go get it? Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Backing it down right now. It's, okay. Uh, uh, each of the covers, uh, of course, kind of plays into the play. And this is a beautiful one because, um, you know, you, but our audience will see it when you hold it up. But what was your favorite chapter in your book? Boy, which which of my kids is the awesomest, you know? You know? I, I love all the chapters that I've put together. There's a piece of the book that has been a recurring theme through all my book, and that is the updated impact of health or alcohol on health, covering the cancer, covering um Things like the relationship between stroke. And one in five strokes in this country is alcohol related. Wow, that's really tough. so. I, I I repeat that chapter, but freshen it up for all of my books. Here's the uh, cover, by the way. That uh, is a beautiful cover. Uh, thank you. I, I in fact I just earned an award that was announced today that I was the USA Best Books Award winner in the current events category. So I was pretty pleased. I've been a finalist in there twice and finally have the win. And uh, I like to think that the cover helped a little bit, but I know it was uh, a testament to uh, what I believe was a, a really solid book from cover to cover. I love the first chapter. I love the way that I'm able to set up. Um, I've always focused on these books as being an educational tool and in part a scientific tool because I do cover a lot of the, the geek speak around the medical industry on the relationship between alcohol and serotonin and looking at acetaldehyde and the terms that we don't whip out in conversation every day, but I still keep the book very conversational. And I think the way I set it up in the opening chapter and the way I bring it to a close in the final chapter uh, is a good resemblance of the, the work that I enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. And so who's your favorite character in the book? Uh, no characters. Um, there's a piece of me in every book. I, I am, mm -hmm. I don't run from my shadows here. So my, my journey with alcohol does appear in each of the books. I, I talk very candidly about, uh, my personal experience with it. This one was a little bit different, though, in that I personally have not used drugs or heroin or opioids. I could always get where I wanted to get with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that was the extent of my experimentation with uh, my altering my mind or getting somewhere other than the present. Mm -hmm. uh, so that part of it is a little bit different in this book. The other books are geared toward people who are struggling with the disease of addiction and the families around them and also public policy. And this one happens to be a little heavier on the public policy side of things. And so is there an overall message in your book that you want the, re the readers to get? What is it? I think the message overall is open your eyes. You're, when we talk about the relationship with alcohol, we're talking about a relationship with a toxin and a known carcinogen. Is it, is it practical and safe to say drink responsibly? Is there a responsible way to drink a toxin and known carcinogen? The connection to the opioid crisis is a straight line. Uh, this is the first drug of choice for people who have used illicit drugs, including opioids. But overall, the health of our country, if we look at the health impact, the economic impact, this drug costs our country $250 billion every year. And that is the, that's enough to buy you, me, and everybody in this country, every man, woman, and baby, a 55 inch LED TV. That's a lot of money every year. So why, why don't we look a little bit closer at our relationship with alcohol mm -hmm. and the economic costs, the health costs, and being a feeder into the cycle of crises that we have? If I, if I indulge me for a moment here, mm -hmm. if you look at all of these drug crises that have come up over the years, you know, the uh, opioids or excuse me, um, heroin in the 1920s, that's related to our relationship with alcohol because we couldn't get alcohol. So we wanted to get something to get us other than somewhere other than where we are today. The 1950s, it was amphetamines. We didn't want it to be thinner, didn't want to be caught drinking uh, the husband's alcohol 
because it was still a male dominated society and it was kind of frowned upon for women to drink. So they went into went the amphetamine. 60s and 70s, heroin, 80s, cocaine and crack, 90s, meth. And we keep running into these cycles of crises and we focus on cleaning up what the cat dragged in. Let's start mm-hmm. looking at what's dragging the cat in. And that's our relationship with alcohol. So, so what is your, what, what is your dream with this? What is your dream for the book, for you, for your future? I love the feedback that I get on my books. Uh, it, a lot of the earlier, a uh, lot of the material in my earlier books is very personal. And when I, when people reach out to me and say I've helped them struggle with their struggle with alcoholism, that's personally rewarding to me. Um, I've won a number of awards, but none of it means anything until I hear those personal stories like I do with this book and all the others. And the stories I enjoy hearing um, regarding or related to look what the cat dra- or look what dragged the cat in is hearing people say, I never thought of it that way. I never thought of this being a cost driver for the healthcare system. I never viewed my drinking as problematic for my health, even though moderate drinking is connected with cancer. Uh, certainly, uh, alcoholic use is definitely a health impact, but even the moderate drinking, and they, this is an eye opener in that regard. And when I hear the personal stories from people who've read the, the work that I've put out, that is definitely the most rewarding part. Mm. So, you know, here's something that, that our audience probably doesn't know. You've actually met seven presidents of the United States. Yeah, You've flown the- with the Navy's Blue Angels. You've piloted as a Los Angeles class nuclear submarine. Mm-hmm. What? And did you take time to discuss any of this with them as well? Uh, yeah. I, every time people read my bio, they're interested. How did, how did you meet seven presidents? I didn't get a chance to meet or uh, to talk with all of them about the, the relationship with alcohol or the my personal journey or my uh, my drive with alcohologist.com and to bring greater attention to the health impacts of this. I, mm-hmm. I did speak with uh, President George W. Bush about it because he and I walk a common path in that he also struggled with his relationship with alcohol. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other opportunities, I was a younger reporter at the time, so that's how I, I met um and I wasn't, I wasn't the drinker that I became. I wasn't, I became the alcoholic, alcoholic I didn't want to be later in life. Uh, so this, this passion of mine and the driver of these books has really been in the past 10 years. Mm-hmm. So how can our audience find your book? You can track it down through my website, with, which is alcohologist.com, alcohologist.com. I'm also available on Amazon. I have a shortened link if you type you book.at slash gateway drug. That'll take you right to the page on Amazon. I'm also available at other online book retailers. Just type in the name, look what dragged the cat in, followed by my name. Hold that up for us a little bit more again. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, And type in my name as well. It's on Barnes and Noble and all the other online booksellers as well. And that link I gave you, you book.at slash gateway drug. That'll take you right to the page. You can also click on my offer page on Amazon, as well as any brick and mortar bookstore. If they don't have it on the shelves, they can order it and uh, have it in stock for you. It's a it's a very um, accessible book for most people. And with all of my books, I've kept the prices as low as I can. I'm not looking to make a mountain of money off mm-hmm. of uh, sharing my experience and my research with uh, people who want a better, deeper look at what alcohol does to you rather than what it does for you. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with us. We were down to our last few minutes, so I wanted to ask you, what is one last thought you'd like to leave with our audience? In 1967, the year I was born, 72% of the adult males smoked. Today, that number is down to 14%. And the way we did it is we changed the dialogue about smoking. We had the mass uh, settlement in 1997, which put in a lot of education about uh, smoking's dangers, and we're teaching kids in kindergarten that. We can do the same thing with alcohol, and we probably should, um, looking at the health impacts that it has and the driver of the cycle of crises that we're in. So if we look at what we've done as uh, uh, with tobacco as the roadmap for the way out of this, then we're on the right path. More education, 
uh, limited access and less exposure to minors. We definitely have to look at alcohol advertising because when more under 18 people are seeing alcohol ads than people over 18, there's a problem. Mm, that's true. Well, I want to thank our audience for being with us tonight. And I, I, a big thank you to you, Scott Stevens, for, for being on the show with us. And if you uh, are interested in more about addiction, uh, Scott Stevens is going to actually be on an uh, expert panel about addiction on January the 22nd, uh, same time, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Make sure you tune in for that. I will be uh, sending out information all over the Internet so you won't forget. And um, for those of you who would like to leave comments about this show, because the show is streaming live on the Facebook page, I will be going in there, and, and I'm sure Scott Steven will also, to uh, answer your, your questions or your comments. Until next time, everyone, be aware of alcoholism, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone.